And this is Mr. M.K. Miles from the museum at Saxis for his presentation. Wow, thank you. Well, now I know who I'm competing with. Uh, you know, we're about halfway between Chincoteague and uh, Chris Field. Geographically, we're right in the middle there. So, uh, so Chincoteague uh, came up and talked to you guys uh, before we did. So, uh, and now we're here, and now you got to go to Chris Field. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, they came too. Traffic, traffic. Yeah. Uh, so, how many of you uh, are from the Virginia part of Delmarva? Oh, a few. Currently. Not born there, but Okay. Here. No, I mean now you're you're in the Virginia part. I'm a couple. A few of you are. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and so how many of you know where Saxes is? Oh, now that is good. So you don't need the little map on the back of my handout. <laughs> and if you get to Zeb's place, you're almost there. <laughs> but we do have a handout here, a, a rack card if any of you are interested. Uh, what I really came for was uh, to pass this around and so somebody could tell me uh, what it is. Uh, do you all know a guy named uh, Kelly from, who lives in Saxes now and he's almost blind? Robert. Robert. Do you, all, do you all ever hear of Robert Kelly? Oh yeah. He's made some beautiful birds over his lifetime but now he's in his He's in his twilight, and uh, he can't see well enough to do anything very fancy anymore. He's a good carver. I didn't he, know he lived in Saxes. So. He lives. He's been in Saxes for a few years now, and so. Uh, so, which one of you guys is the most knowledgeable? Can I hand this to you, and you just pass it around? This is what Robert Kelly did. Right there, the guy in the gray shirt. Robert Kelly made this and donated it to the Saxes Island Museum. And we're trying to figure out it's a copy of what? A cow. A cow. A copy of a cow. You guys are right. With an Ira Hudson style head. That's what he told me. <laughs> Just to check. Just check it. Okay. So I'm here among experts. Uh, and I'm not a collector or a carver. But uh, when I graduated from Atlantic High School, I played football and I had a number 11 on my jersey. And uh, for five years before I graduated from Atlantic High School, a guy named Carol E. Marshall had a number 11 on his high school football jersey. He was a quarterback and I was a quarterback. So uh, you guys made a nice donation to the Saxes Island Museum when Carol E. passed uh, a year or two ago. And we really appreciate it. And that's the first time I heard of the Delmarva Decoy Collectors Association when, when we got to check. So I really appreciate that. Carol Lee was a quarterback. Yep. Yeah. He, he was small guy in high school. That's hard to believe. Yeah, yeah, he was quarterback. He was. And he, he had small. Yeah, he was small. Uh, he had a younger brother named Guy Marshall, was a couple years younger than him and a couple Danny. years older than me, and then he had a brother named Danny. Danny's still Danny's still carving. Yeah. Awesome Car carving. Yeah, Danny is too. A great well. He's probably better than Carol Lee, depending on whether you like fancy stuff or whether you like rough stuff. Yeah. Carol Lee's a little on the rough side and Dan Danny would spend hours and days putting Carol two. Carol Lee was very generous with his work. He was. I don't know anybody gave more stuff to DU and charities and stuff than Carol Lee. Um, yeah. He was a good hearted guy. He loved it. He carved on the uh, on the porch of the Saxes Island Museum the last three years of his life. Mostly every Saturday, especially during the summer uh, months and the tourists would come over to their Airbnbs and come over to the restaurants and they all stopped and said, what are you doing here on the porch? And they just loved to talk to him and he loved to talk to everybody who came through there. So we now have uh, two plaques when you go into Saxes Island Museum. There's a, well, on the right side of the door that says it's been on the National Register of Historic Places since 2017. And on the other side, right over where he said carve, it's, it's exactly like that. They look like the same from the road. It's a, it's a model of that, but it says, in memory of Carol E. Marshall, Mr. Carver. There were two little boys who came to Saxis to spend the summer with their grandmother. They were from Boulder, Colorado. And the first time they come up there and they're about that tall, they don't even know what he's doing and they've never seen a decoy. And uh, he had made two little teeny ones about, you know, two inches. He gave each one of them one, and they called him Mr. Carver. 
<laughs> and he just fell in love with those little boys. And uh, so the little sign, the memorial sign for Carolee says Mr. Carver on it. And every time Marlene drives by there and stops, she cries. Do you all know his wife, Marlene? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I've been Carolee for a while. Yeah. So I was uh, going to uh, put you all through a little test. Everybody in here has a smartphone? Yeah. It's not, most of you have one. If you're like me, it's just a matter of whether do you know how to use it. So uh, I have a little trouble with my smartphone once in a while, but uh, I use Google Maps. You know, there's other kind of maps to help you find some place. So, but I use Google Maps. So when we opened up the museum uh, in, in uh, 2017, uh, I put an app in Google Maps if you, if you type in, in Google, if you type in 20101 Saxes Road, this is our 911 address there, and you click on it, it'll tell you how long it's going to take to get there and the winding way to get in there. And if you're living at Crisfield, you're going to have to make this great big loop around to get nine miles. We're nine miles from Crisfield, but we're 50 miles to get there by car. And uh, if you click on... There's a picture of the, uh, the museum there, and if you click on that, you'll see pictures, about 30 pictures of the museum and the collections in the museum. That was the best way I could tell to get the word out. And the last time I looked, that's been up there about five or six years, last time I looked, it had about 25,000 hits. And probably in that same time, we probably had 2,000 visitors total in five years. <laughs> Shigathi Island Museum will get that many in a week or two in the summer. And just to give you an idea of how many people come down on the lower shore, uh, you know, on your way to Shigathi, there's a Nassau Wallops Island Visitor Center. They usually have 100,000 people a year. Wow. And their biggest week of the year is when a launch fails or when a launch gets delayed. <laughs> The people just hanging around with nothing to do, waiting two more days. They go to the NASA Visitor Center and the Shigatig Island Museum, but they don't come to Saxis. <laughs> so we're, we're very much out of the way and, and a little hard to get to. You're in there that you're in the same town as the Hurricane Lounge, and you probably get a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> we do. The Hurricane, we started selling hats and T-shirts, and when uh, Captain E's opened up, Joy and Sandy started making hats and T-shirts, and our sales dropped right off, and theirs boomed. People would rather drink than come into the museum, I can tell you that. But uh, over here we have a, a, a couple of poster boards with some pictures of the building. Uh, I don't know if any of you looked at it when you walked by. Uh, it was built in 1910. Uh, it's just a one room. It's 20 by 30. It's, it's not as big as this room. Uh, it's a general store. Uh, in the 1920s, Saxes had 650 people there. That was the highlight of Saxis from when it began until today. 650 people in the early 1920s. And there were eight general stores on Saxis. Uh, you could get off the island by a horse and buggy. Uh, but so everybody bought everything on the island. And that's why we had eight general stores for 650 people. Mm -hmm. Today there's about 150 people there. Uh, and this is the only store building left on the t in, in town. Um, Hurricane Sandy came through in October of 12, and even though it made landfall up in New Jersey and ripped the hell out of the coast up there, you, you lost your house in Sandy? I didn't lose it. We were on a hill. But. Yeah, in New Jersey. Yeah. yeah. So the tail, when, when Sandy hits up there, the big tail spin around, comes right up Pocomoke Sound, right across Tangier Island, heads right at Saxes and Crisfield. Saxes and Crisfield are the two most damaged places in the state of Virginia, and Crisfield in the state of Maryland. But FEMA jumped right on it and started uh, paying for having homes raised and repaired after Sandy. And we had our first home was raised uh, earlier this year, only 10 and a half years after Sandy, FEMA finally came in. <laughs> That's what you call being out of the way. <laughs> but. Um, so we had an 85 mile an hour wind. That's not that bad. Hurricane Hazel in 1954 when I was five years old was 105 miles an hour. But Hurricane Hazel came over, uh, direct hit, uh, the hurricane went right over town. 
Duration, six hours. Sandy, duration, three days. The tide came up and stayed up, three days. And it's the tide of record. Down there at uh, Kiefer Linton, one of our duck carvers who passed away a couple years ago, he had a mark on the side of his concrete building of, of the t high tides down here, you know, Hazel, uh, Floyd, Sandy. <clears throat> so Kiefer was the, uh, the record keeper for us. Um, and so Sandy's the tide of record at Saxis, and that's why all those homes are being raised over there now. Uh, luckily, I lived on the south end of Saxis, and I got tied in, in the road, across the road in front of the house. My cars were parked next to the house, so I couldn't leave because I'd have to drive through a foot of water to get out of there, but uh, I did okay. The museum happens to be in the middle of town on eight foot elevation. Wow. Uh, I'm about six and a half feet. The north end of the island, the problem is where everybody comes on and off. The north end of the island is only three feet above sea level. So when I was a kid, <clears throat> Hurricane Hazel flooded the, the, the north end of the island. And uh, every year during hurricane season, we'd have a high water to, to block entrance to the town. Sea levels rising at Saks is about a foot every 100 years, and some say two feet every 100 years. So and I'm 74 years old, so in my lifetime, sea level's risen about that much. And uh, the, the tide blocks the road coming in and off the island now two or three times a month instead of once or twice a year. So uh, you can believe in sea level rise, especially when you only live about five or six feet above sea level. But yeah, to put it in perspective, the highest land on Saxes is eight feet. The highest land on Tangier down the main ridge is five and a half. The highest land at Rhodes Point and Tylerton on Smith Island Four and a half. So guess what happened at Saxes in 1850? The Spence family from the very south end of, of Smith Island, the port next to Tangier, that part that was in Virginia, flooded so often the Spence family moved to Saxes in, in about 1848. And when they got there, the great grandson of one of them, Hattie Way Spence, who's been dead a few years, he told me that they said, uh, thank God Almighty, high, high land at last. <laughs> they got to Saxes. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, but all that tidal uh, marsh around us, we're about 3,000 acres around us, it makes for great duck hunting. And uh, during World War II, there was a couple of duck hunting clubs, one at Fox Island, which is a little bit closer to uh, Chris Field, and there's one on, on the Virginia side that we called uh, uh, Drum Bay. It's a, little, it's a little body of water down there. We called the Drum Bay Hunt Club. And so we had these two hunt clubs, and the guys from Saxes were the guides. So when people would fly down or come down from Baltimore or Washington, you know, it was a guy from Saxes in a skiff who had put the decoys out and spread the corn and took them out to be sure they got something. And they would take them back by the car load when they went back home. Uh, an admiral came down named Admiral Land during World War II. Um, several admirals came down duck hunting. Uh, there's a guy at Saxes now who has uh, Admiral Land's shotgun. He thinks it's worth about a half a million dollars, I think, but <laughs> he has the shotgun. So some of those, uh, those days are... Uh, sort of memories now because for some reason, when I was a kid, the black ducks were flying over the marsh around the house it's like blackbirds now. They just in, in droves, plenty of them. It's rare now to see a black duck. We got other ducks, but we, for some reason, the black ducks don't come across much anymore. Do you all know Grayson Chesser? No. <laughs> <laughs> Grayson's a friend of mine, uh, uh, and he takes, still takes some hunting parties out. He had a little hunt club there at his place on Holden's Creek, and he brings them down across Saxes. Danny Marshall owned the island south of Saxes called Tunnels Island for a while. He took duck hunting parties out. So there's very few duck hunting parties going out of Saxes now, and there's no guides from Saxes. We had a, we, one of our guys who left Saxes and went to Shinkatig, his name is Andy Linton. If you're from the you know, Shinkatig people, you know Andy Linton. He's about my age. Uh, so he, he makes a living taking uh, duck hunter, guiding for duck hunting. And uh, busy. So he's busy. 
He's busy during duck hunting season. That's for sure. So uh, what we were do what I also have here besides this uh, the cob thing is I have these two miniatures. Uh, I'll take these to the same guy. I have these two little miniatures here that a friend of mine, a cousin of mine who died a few years ago made, Kiefer Linton. And he signed them. And do, do, do any of you know or heard of Kiefer Linton? Yeah, I know him. He's a good guy. And Martha. And Martha. Yep. Yeah. I knew Kiefer pretty well. Kiefer had the patience of a saint married to that woman. <laughs> <laughs> now be careful. She's my double second cousin. Uh -oh. <laughs> You're right, though. <laughs> so quiet. So what we did was uh, these have changed hands several times because you know these these are both 1994, so they've been around a while. So they're passing them around. Somebody sells them to somebody, gives them to somebody, uh, and we got a guy at Saks is now our harbor master who uh, has offered them to us uh, to put back in the museum on Saks. Our goal is to have things in the Saxes Island Museum made by people from Saxes. So we got some Carolees in there. Uh, we're gonna have some Kiefer Lintons in there. We'd like to get a Danny Marshall in there. I'd like to get a Grayson Chesser in there. And what do you think Grayson said when I asked him? <laughs> he, said, need it. he said, I'll loan you one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was talking to, uh, to Laurel about uh, stuff like this, and she said, why don't you come up and meet everybody and uh, get a feel for what it's like and uh, see if we could help you maybe with purchasing some of these or getting them on loan or something like that, because you've got you know, more decor carvers here than, than I've ever been in one room with. So I don't know how often you might come in touch with somebody who owns a Kiefer Linton or a Danny Marshall or a Carol Lee Marshall. Or, uh, oh, you know Andy Linton. When we first opened, Andy Linton come by, and I had a couple of decoys in the window. And he stopped, and he looked at them, and he said, MK, where'd you get these decoys? I said, well, who do you think made them, Andy? He said, I know who made them, my father. So I married a girl from Sanford, and her father bought those two decoys from Andy's dad, probably... 50 years ago. And so they passed from my father-in-law to my wife to me, and now we put them in the Saxes Island Museum. Another, and, when, and when Andy's dad made them, he lived at Saxes. So one of the objectives of, of us, me and Jim, who maintain this little museum over there, is to get Saxes stuff in the museum. If we can't, we'll get a little bit of Sanford stuff or Hallwood stuff or Chrisfield stuff. <laughs> As a kid, <clears throat> My grandfather died when I was 12. Uh, he was 70 years old and he had a heart attack. So any time between the age of 6 and 12, certain times a year, he had to drive to Crisfield to get some decoys. I had no idea what was going on. I went along for the ride. But he bought them from the Ward brothers. I don't know where they went. <laughs> a lot of them like that. A lot of them like that, yep. Yeah. So uh, I've been around decoys a lot, but carving is something that I just can't seem to get the handle on. So it's Marty Linton from Marty Linton is from Saxes. Yeah. He's in Pokemon now, right? Yeah. He grew up. Yeah. He makes a nice piece. Yeah. His his dad and I are about the same age. His dad's three four years older than I am. Yeah. He'd be a good one to have. Yeah. So I don't know what else. Uh, other than, let me just say about the museum itself, it's been there, it's open, the old store has been open for five years, it's on the National Register. We have no paid employees. Everything is 100% volunteer. <laughs> I'm the chairman of the museum group, and Jim Lewis owns the store, it's been in his family for five generations. It's called the Crockett Store, the Crockett's came from Tangier to Saxis about 1820. So the land that it's on is, has been in Jim's family since 1820, and the building's been in his family since 1910. So uh, 
It's, it's homegrown. It's all volunteer. No paid staff. And if you look at the uh, thing on their phone, you'll see that we're closed today. <laughs> and it only says we're open on Saturday, but that's not true. We're open anytime you call me or Jim. <laughs> we just meet you there. You know the old commercial about the Maytag repairman? When we first started, we opened up, we went there and sit down and waited for the people to come in, and nobody comes in. <laughs> but I'll tell you what happens now is if somebody calls and makes an appointment, and usually these Airbnbs, we got six or seven of them over there now, so this time of year they start, people start trickling in. They go by there, they see the sign in the window, they call me, and I go in there and open. And while their car is parked out front and we're in there, two or three more cars will stop and they'll come in and say, thank God, you're open. We've been waiting for you to open. I said, well, there's a number in the window. Why don't you call it? Didn't want to bother you. <laughs> wow. So uh, you, can, you can call anytime. Uh, she's got our, our numbers. Uh, you can come by anytime. Just call so I can be there to open the door. If you come in the summer months when, when you can ride a golf cart, I give golf cart tours of town. There's no entry fee and no prices. We have a donation jar there, so uh, we're making it. We've been, in, we've been open for five years and we can afford the insurance. Yeah. And it's something about insurance in a place like Saxis. It's, it's our number one annual expense is insurance on the building. <clears throat> Guess who insured our building the first year we were open? Lloyd's of London. Yeah, they do them odd policies. We use, a, we use an insurance broker here in Salisbury, and they take bids. And people from, companies from all over the world are investing in taxes because they know they can charge whatever the hell they want, and we have no option. When we got a grant from the National Park Service six years ago when we were restoring the building, they said we had to keep the building insured in perpetuity for the amount of the grant. And we got a $120,000 grant, so we have to keep it insured for $120,000. The county appraises the, the building for about 30, <laughs> but we have to pay for $120,000 worth of insurance. But if you ever saw the building, you'd see it's immaculate. It's been restored to its original 1910 condition by a, a, a person named uh, Chip Knock from Stockton, Merlin, and we couldn't have got a better contractor because he did everything just right for that building. If you ever come to see it, you'll realize that it's about 80% original. Doors, windows, floors, 100, 100 and, uh, almost 120 years old. It's beautiful. So, uh, any questions? Come see us whenever you want. So are most of the items owned by the museum or are most of the items on loan? Or how, how do you get your inventory? The, uh, the inventory has been donated to us. Uh, there was about three big donors. Um, if you're familiar with the Accomack County, there was a guy named Kurt Mariner who wrote a lot of history books, nine or ten of them. He passed away a few years ago. He had a little private museum collection in, his, in a, a, an old store in uh, New Church. Jim and I went to see how his thing was restored while we were restoring saxes, and he had uh, like a pot belly stove in there and showcases and nail kegs and things that you would see in an old country store. And he told us he had prostate cancer that returned. He knew he only was limited. And he said, my will says, you get everything I got. So he died about the, about the same year we opened is the year he died. And we got two pickup load stuff from his store. We just went in there, to, the executor of his state said, come and get whatever you want. Uh, if you know uh, Alan Thornton, who owns the big junk shop on 13, headed south? Closed now. Closed now, yeah. Two pickup loads. We got some wonderful stuff in the museum. Uh, and as far as it, it's all been given to us, on either they gave us a paperwork to sign that said it's ours or it's like on permanent donation. So do you do oyster collectibles too or just decoys? Well, oh, we have oyster tongs hanging on the ceilings, hanging on the walls. Uh, this guy here, Kelly, said he can't corpse so well anymore. He's made some wooden oysters that we have. Kieford made some wooden oysters. Kieford made an oyster knife out of a piece of the Harvey A. drawer, the boat, the Harvey A. drawer, the Chesapeake Bay Bye boat that we had. Um, we got a lot of 
stuff from that boat, the Harvey A. drawer that was in the cabin, the wheel, the compass, and lots of stuff like that. So uh, not just decoys, anything. So come and take a look. If you can get on Google Maps and, and, and type in 20101 Saxis Road, there's a lot of close-up pictures of the dis of the I collection. I just couldn't catch you open. <laughs> couldn't catch it open. <laughs> and you weren't close enough to read the sign with the phone number on it. <laughs> no signal. <laughs> well, believe it or not, we got Wi-Fi at the museum now. We got internet. So. Uh, there were two expenses. Yeah, yeah. You lose a lot of signal trying to get down. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you do, uh, the other thing I have on my phone besides Google Maps is I have a thing called Tides Near Me. It's a free app. Tides Near Me. Type in Starlings Creek before you come and before you plan to leave. Because if it's a heavy wind out of the south <laughs> and you're hit there on high tide, and the, the, the tide between low and high there is about two and a half a feet. So if you come in on a low tide and want to leave on a high tide, you might have to spend a few extra hours on the island or you got to drive through six to eight inches of water to get off the island. Yeah, west wind don't bother you all? North and west seems to blow it out of there, but south, southwest, southeast blows it right in. Yeah. Any other questions? Or I guess I've fulfilled my uh, commitment to Meet you all. <laughs> Thank you very much.